Chief Petty Officer Jordan Brownell slapped his hands on the table and leaned over. Shit! You're telling me these creatures can turn people into monsters? I jumped in my chair, startled, and took a breath. I... I don't know. I think it's a good possibility, one that shouldn't be ignored. Natalie's grandmother, I still don't know her name, claimed that she was touched by one of the sea creatures. She changed, I said. The biology of the mermaids suggested, possibly, that it may have been human, or at the very least it's related to humans. Being part fish, that would probably exclude it from being a direct primate. Do you think it was human to begin with? Brownell asked. I think so, but I can't be sure. I paused to stare at Brownell. He was imposing, but that facade was faltering. Haven't you been listening? None of this makes any sense. I'm grasping at straws with these assumptions. For all we know, these creatures spawned by some twisted god of the deep. The rules of biology don't really apply anymore. Do you have any other evidence to support your assumptions about the origin of these? What did you call them? Sunken ones, I whispered. And yes, I do. It arrived with the rogue waves from the spire. We could do nothing as wave after wave assaulted the ocean liberty. I wasn't scared of the waves, though. They could knock us around the ocean, tilt us, or even capsize us. It didn't matter. My fear came from that wriggling mass riding the rogue waves, lurking somewhere in the deep. The sea worm. Perhaps that name didn't fit. Maybe it was more leviathan than worm, like the demon in Revelations. Thinking of the Bible at a time like this seemed foolish. I gave up on religion a long time ago, to the disdain of my father, the preacher. But, given the current circumstances, I couldn't help but reconsider the nature of our world. Biblical or not, we were facing something that should not be. I hunkered down on the bridge, behind a chair bolted to the floor. The ship's bow turned sharply as we attempted to cut through another wave. We lifted higher and higher, towards the crest, until we crashed down on the other side. How much could this massive cruise ship take? I'm not a structural engineer, but I know the hull had to be under a massive amount of stress being thrown about like this. I looked around the room. Things seemed a bit calmer, though not calm enough to attempt to get to my feet. And Lydia was still missing. Captain, I said, how long can we take this? His face told me everything I needed to know. Not much longer. You could see the stress etched across his face, mirroring the strain mounting on the ship. We need to think about abandoning the ship, he said. In the lifeboats? That's insane. There's no way those little boats would withstand these waves, I said. You're wrong, Doctor, Abad said. They're capsule ships, completely submersible and self-riding. They can take everything these waves have and will always come back to the surface rightly. What about the people being thrown around inside? I asked. The seats are padded with emergency six-pointed harnesses. It might be a bit rough, but they're secure enough. I looked up at the spire, looming huge, but shorter now. It was boring into the ocean, causing rogue waves with each mass of rotation, like a giant auger. It wasn't just some structure hitting the planet, it moved with clear purpose and intent, like an engine. Something inside me churned with each rotation. As the spire drove deeper into the ocean, I felt sick. I forced myself to look away. When should we start evacuations? Sexton asked. As head of security, it would be his job to get all the passengers into the lifeboats. Which made me pause for just a moment. What about the passengers? Were they still locked in their rooms? Considering the circumstances, I wouldn't have been kept locked up during all this. We might have a bigger problem on our hands if they're out roaming the ship. I was able to walk over to Abad, realizing that we hadn't faced a wave for a few minutes. Maybe it was over. Maybe we could make it back without the lifeboats. But, just as my hopes were beginning to build, I glanced out the window again. I couldn't see the spire anymore. The horizon was... Pure blue and white, streaked with dark shadows. Only, that blue and white was racing towards us. Another wave. 
bigger this time, unimaginably bigger. I glanced at Abad, who was transfixed on the monster wave. Fear etched his face. The stoic sailor was terrified. The wave crashed into the ship, lifting us up sharply. The bow now pointed towards the sky. I hung onto the captain's chair, bolted to the floor. My legs dangled beneath me. I could see the crew plastered against the wall at my feet. People screamed as they lost their grip and fell down the length of the bridge. The ship was falling backwards, or at least felt like it was. We rose higher and higher towards the crest. The ship shook violently. I nearly lost my grip. I could hear the Ocean Liberty strain to keep her form. Deep groans bellowed from the belly of the ship until, snap! The hull buckled with a deafening boom. People screamed, jolted by the horror of the moment. The vibrations rattled the ship, and I lost my grip. I plummeted towards the wall beneath me, crashing into some of the crew. I cried out in pain and struggled to pick myself up. Sunlight shot through the window, suddenly blinding us all, and then we plunged down the backside of the wave. I yelped as we fell. I knew this was my doom. We'd sink in a matter of seconds. Instead of coming to rest at the bottom, the ship rattled and screamed. It drove deeper into the ocean, popping back out and coming to rest on her side. I looked up at Captain Abad. He didn't have to say a word. We needed to abandon ship. Sexton, Abad said. You know what to do. Sexton pulled himself up by his lone arm on the console stand. He went to the intercom pressed a few buttons on a laptop, and closed it. Klaxon alarms blared. The alarms quieted as Captain Abad's voice came on the PA. Alert to all passengers and crew. We are abandoning ship. Follow the emergency signs and yellow lines to the emergency exits on the port side of the main deck. The starboard side is unavailable for emergency exit. Help any elderly, young or disabled first. All crew at ready stations prepare to count and assist passengers. The klaxons blared again, quieting every few cycles to repeat Captain Abad's message. We have to go, Lydia said. I nearly shit myself and I jumped forward in shock. Where the hell were you? She pointed behind her at an open door. There's seating with harnesses in there. I yelled at you to follow, but you completely ignored me. Captain Abad shook my hand, and then Lydia's. You two are passengers here. You've done much for me, and I will never be able to repay you. I need you to get to the lifeboats with the other passengers. Lydia and I shared a glance between us, and looked back at Abad, puzzled. Murray, I've never lost a ship before. This will be my first, and I intend to go down with her, he said. Sexton, please escort Lydia and Micah to a lifeboat. It's the least we can do for our honored guests. And, Abad continued, I need you to get on that lifeboat with them. Oh, hell no, Sexton said. That is an order. You're hurt, and you will be on that lifeboat with them, Abad said, without room for question. In fifteen years, I've never once failed you. No matter which ship you captained, I've fought pirates and mercenaries for you. I've taken men's lives. I'm not leaving you now. He looked around the room. You know what you mean to me. I expected Abad to get angry. Instead, he embraced Sexton, cradling his head, put his lips to his. I love you too. I won't have your blood on my hands. You mean too much to me. I thought I saw tears in Sexton's eyes. Abed let him go. Sexton nodded silently and went toward the exit and motioned for us to follow. We arrived at the port side deck after what seemed like an eternity. All the commotion made it difficult for us to move about the ship efficiently. Not surprisingly, the well-organized crew was safely boarding a majority of the passengers into the cradled lifeboat capsules, despite the ship's extreme tilt. I wouldn't have expected anything less from Captain Abad's crew. Passengers hurried, though under control of the crew, to the lifeboats. After a lifeboat filled, a crew member designated to pilot that lifeboat, climbed in. After several checks, the crate alarms popped out, the linkage snapped, and the boat dropped to the sea. Lifeboat after lifeboat plopped into the water. 
Shortly after each one hit, a diesel engine roared to life, and the boats cruised away from the Ocean Liberty. Let's go, Sexton said. He held the railing against the tilt and made his way towards the unoccupied lifeboats. His battle rifle hung from his shoulder. We followed. I heard someone scream behind me. I swiveled my head around to check. More were screaming now. Some had lost their footing and slipped down the deck. Others threw themselves away from the railing. I climbed onto the railing to get a better view. Thick, ripples of ocean current pelted the ship relentlessly. People screamed and pointed towards the water. Something was there, just under the surface. A massive black shadow slid beneath the ship. The lifeboats noticed now. They sped away from whatever dark mass crept just beneath the surface. Then it breached. A long, scaly black tube. The sea worm I had seen from a distance earlier. It was grotesque and more horrible than I could imagine. Thousands of tubular, round mouths grew from its hide around the head. One gigantic mouth, the main mouth, opened up at the end of the tube. Millions of razor-sharp teeth encircled the inside of the maw from every direction, like a meat grinder. The giant worm, serpent, whatever it was, floated just on the surface. The main mouth gaped open, swallowing leagues of water every second like a vacuum. The small, tumorous-like mouths on its head were also circular, only much smaller, like tiny appendages, though still big enough to eat a human. They snapped wildly at the passengers still on the ship, like they had a mind of their own, and each one was ravenous. Suddenly, the sea worm brought its head out of the water and smacked it down with a sickening boom on top of a lifeboat. People screamed and everyone panicked. The crew froze, and the passengers ran back inside the ship, trampling each other in the process. It was chaos. Sexton pulled the rifle to his shoulder with one good arm. He leaned against the railing and steadied the handguard at the end of the rifle on his stump. But he didn't fire. We watched the horrific scene play out on the water. The lifeboat, which was about the size of a bus, was swallowed effortlessly by the creature. Pieces of the boat, bodies, and scraps of flesh were flung from its mouth like a blender as its teeth shredded its first meal. The water was a thick, red soup of flesh, boat, and bone. Those unfortunate to still be alive bobbed in the water, mutilated and screaming. Every move the huge worm made created torrents in the water, sucking the hopeless passengers back into its gaping mouth. We have to go, Sexton yelled. Back the other way. Where? I shouted desperately. These are the only lifeboats we can use. Sexton pointed to the water with his rifle. Look at that. They seemed to appear from under the sea worm. Hundreds of them. Fish-like humanoids swimming through the water, cutting right through the torrents and flows caused by the sea creature, as if they were swimming in a calm pool. They clambered aboard the lifeboats not taken down by the sea worm. I watched in horror. What are they carrying? Lydia pulled herself closer to the railing to see. Sexton peered through the scope on his rifle. Spears, nets, and ropes with hooks too. Scurrying onto the lifeboats, the mer creatures stabbed and tore at the capsule's top until they opened a hole big enough to dive into. Passengers tried to escape, but they were either killed, caught in the mer creatures' nets, or hooked and bound with rope. The scope of the carnal scene finally came into focus. They weren't just killing. They were capturing, but why? For slaves? Breeders? To turn them into more mer creatures? They're coming! Lydia screamed. The mer creatures hooked on to the lifeboat cradle arms and one after another climbed up the ship's deck. Sexton shoved me and Lydia down a corridor, back towards the crew ship's interior. A few shots rang out from his rifle before he followed. We went down a flight of stairs and into one of the main hallways. Where are we going? I asked. Lydia and I both looked at Sexton. Are there any other lifeboats? she asked. 
We can't take the lifeboat's lid. That fucking creature will devour us. Or those merfolk will capture us. There has to be another option. Right, Sexton? He looked at the two of us and down the hall. All three of us were soaked to the bone and freezing. I could see his face tighten with concern as he considered his options. We're going to the bridge, Sexton said. He let his rifle drop and catch on the sling. He pulled his sidearm, a sleek-looking polymer pistol. He handed it to me along with four magazines. It's loaded and ready. Point and shoot. We ran down the hall and up a flight of stairs towards the bridge. I heard it before I saw it. Several doors burst open behind us. Shouts and strange chattering of the merfolk erupted when they saw us. Sexton spun and fired. I turned to face the intruders. Three massive fish-like humanoids. Merfolk, carrying spears and hooks, rushed at us. Another shot rang out. Sexton caught the closest in the forehead. Inky blood splattered against the wall, and it crumbled to the ground. With a shaky hand, I brought the pistol up and aimed at the next. I pulled the trigger three times. Nothing. I didn't hit a thing. The two remaining creatures moved closer. Sexton took down the next with a burst of bullets to its chest. It crashed to the floor and spasmed wildly. The third was upon us. Within arm's reach of Sexton, its rusty, weathered spear stabbed ferociously at him. Sexton sidestepped, using his rifle to deflect the blow. Sexton was forced back as the onslaught continued. The creature stabbed with the spear in its right hand and clawed with the hook in its left. He tried to raise the rifle for another shot, but the creature was too aggressive. It snagged Sexton's right leg with the hook, and he stumbled to the floor. The creature pounced, the spear point driving into the floor where Sexton's head was. Both were shouting wildly as they toppled over each other on the floor. The commotion stopped. The creature had dropped its spear in the scuffle, but it had Sexton by the throat. Sexton's arm and stump wailed against the creature's chest, but he was losing consciousness. I raised my pistol and took two clean shots. One penetrated the creature's shoulder, and the other hit the wall behind it. It reeled from the pain, but Sexton, in that moment, drew the knife from his belt, the same one I'd used to amputate his arm, and plunged it into the creature's skull from under its jaw. The creature's body went rigid. Sexton stabbed again and again, until it released its grip and fell to the ground dead, in a pool of obsidian black blood. I ran to Sexton and pulled the massive body off of him. Are you okay? I asked. His lips parted into a small, bitter smirk. That was fun, he said, coughing. I pulled Sexton to his feet. He struggled to stand and winced from pain. I noticed a large gash on his leg from the hook. It was pretty bad, but not too serious. Can you walk? I asked. Sexton nodded. We need to go before more come. I don't want to do that again, he said. We reached the bridge several minutes later, luckily not confronting any more of the mer-creatures. Captain Abad sat alone at the helmsman's seat, staring out the window. He must have heard us coming, but he just sat there silently. The ship had sunk further at this point. Saxon climbed up to him against the tilt. Captain, he started. They're all dying, aren't they? Captain Abad asked. There's nothing you can do. There's nothing anyone can do, Saxon said. We're facing monsters from the sea. There was a long pause. He didn't even bother to look at us. I'm going to die with my ship, Captain Abad said. Save yourselves if you can. He leaned over the console and put his head into his hands. Save ourselves? How do you suggest we do that? I asked, pissed off that this seafaring captain had lost his will to fight. He was supposed to be a man of the sea, courageous and tough. I marched up to him, grabbed him by the back of his shirt and pulled him to his feet. Face me! He slowly turned around. His eyes were bloodshot from tears. I slapped him. Wake up, man, I said. I've studied my entire life in academia. God damn it, I know a lot. But you know ships and the ocean better than anyone I've ever met. I glanced at Sexton, who had taken a step forward, but I ignored him. 
If he was going to attack me for slapping Abad, then so be it. Captain? What do we do? He glanced from Lydia to Sexton, and finally his gaze fell on me. I... I don't know. He sunk into the captain's chair, defeated. He really didn't know. Not that I had had much hope to begin with, but still, the captain seemed like a glowing light in all this. A stalwart statue that stood hard against any disaster. But he wasn't. He was just a man, broken and crying. There had to be something. Even if there were some lifeboats on the port side of the ship, we couldn't get to them through the murk creatures. And if we could, the sea worm would eat us alive. My thoughts raced. What about the other side? The side under the water? Captain, you told me earlier that these lifeboat capsules were completely submersible, right? That they'd always come to the surface and right themselves? He glanced at me. Yes, he said. If we can get to the other side of the ship, could we still use those? It'd give us our best chance. He thought about it for a second. The great alarm should still release underwater. We haven't acquired enough negative buoyancy that the water shouldn't have reached too far into the ship. The lower belly was sealed automatically by the ship's systems. He paused. I can't guarantee anything, and we might have to make a swim for the lifeboat. Right. There's a plan, Sexton said. Let me run to my locker in the security office and then we'll go. The security office was located just down the hall from the bridge, but Sexton had disappeared for five long minutes before he returned with a backpack, another rifle, and a fat, curved sword on his duty belt. The sword itself wasn't impressive, more like a machete than a saber. No fancy adornments. Some type of black, polymer, or plastic handle. A rough blade. Sexton handed the spare rifle to Captain Abad. His own rifle hung loose in the sling around his shoulder. He then disconnected the machete from his belt and gave it to Abad. The Somali blade, he said. I looked at him, wondering what he meant. The leader of a Somali pirate gang offered it to Captain Abad as a sign of surrender, but only after we killed the majority of his crew when they attacked a cargo ship we were running, Sexton said to me. It's only fitting that he wields it into battle now, and I brought more than just the sword from Somalia, Sexton said. He withdrew a grenade from his pack. Holy shit, I said. Captain Abad smiled and slung the rifle over his shoulder. He accepted the sword enthusiastically, spinning it in the air, balancing it, and finishing with a flourish. It's been a long time since I've wielded a sword, the captain said. Not since I won the Royal Navy Sabre competition on the HMS Temeraire. A smile danced across his face. Sexton, we probably won't make it out alive, but we will fight to the end, though. Finally, I felt the captain had regained some of his composure. If we're going to do this, we best do it now, Lydia said. We left the bridge and headed down the stairs to where Sexton, Lydia and I, had previously battled the mer creatures. At the bottom of the stairs, the one shot in the chest was still alive, and had pulled itself to a wall. There was a trail of inky black blood soaking into the carpet. The stench was terrible. It struggled to breathe. Raspy air slurred out of the gill slits on its throat. Those bulbous black eyes followed our every move. Captain Abed kicked it in the chest and raised a rifle. Fuck you. Fuck all your kind for attacking my ship. The thing let out a croak. Abad hesitated. What? What did you say? The locker waits for you. It said in a croaky, sloshy voice. It struggled to breathe. Davy Jones locker? Abad asked, raising his rifle again. Don't, Lydia said. It can talk to us. It has knowledge of us. At least our lore, maybe our history, something. Abad Sexton and I looked at her. What are you? She asked the creature. Forsaken. We are sunken ones. 
it said. Were you human? Why are you taking people? Where do you live? She asked, croaked again, letting out a rattle of air. Fowler comes, hunter of the shadow, rising from the depths. It laughed at us. A raspy, wet cackle. Abed let the rifle go and drew his sword. He decapitated the creature in one swift motion. We left it there, assured all were dead. We headed towards the starboard deck, where, hopefully, the lifeboats could still be used. We opened the small maintenance hatch on the deck. I knew this part would be the hardest, as the deck sloped sharply down to the railing. If we lose footing here, we could find ourselves in the water. Find ourselves swimming with the sunken ones. That's what it had said they were. We had no other word for them. At this point, the edge of the railing was only ten feet above the water now, whereas before, it was a couple hundred. Behind us, I could see that half of the ship was completely submerged at deck level. We came out near the forward, where it was still slightly above water. We worked our way down the railing toward the nearest lifeboat, trying hard not to lose our footing. The ship bobbed about aggressively, and the deck was soaked. I could hear the horrid cries of the passengers and crew stranded in the water. I didn't look for them. I couldn't bear it. The four of us pressed on. We reached the lifeboat controls, and Captain Abad prepared the vessel for launch. Skittering feet, sloshing water, and aggressive chattering came from behind us, where the ship was already submerged. The sunken ones. They'd found us. I glanced back at them as Captain Abad fiddled with the crane controls. Their spears pointed in our direction, their hooks at the ready to capture us. We need to hurry, I said. They're coming. Sexton, supporting the handguard of the rifle on his stump, began to fire. A group of sunken ones, there had to be more than a dozen, rushed at us. Several dropped as Sexton fired, but the rest kept coming. Captain, I yelled. Sexton stood between us and them, moving his way down the deck, closer to them. He was creating a safer distance between us. He kept a steady aim, taking one down after another. More emerged from the water. Their misshapen, almost human feet fought for footing on the slick deck. Their heavy, scaly skin and fishy faces screamed in rage. A spear flew by my head. I pulled the pistol from my pocket. I began to shoot, though only two rounds from the first magazine hit, and not critically. Sexton could not hold them off any longer. They rushed over him like a wave. I could see him struggling in a pile under them. They clawed and screamed and stabbed. No! Abad cried. Then, boom. My brain rattled in my skull, and I was knocked down from the blast. I looked up to see body parts and black blood flung all over the deck. The realization hit me. Sexton used a grenade. He sacrificed himself and took out a number of sunken ones with him, but more clambered out of the water and rushed at us. Lydia turned and ran, but she was going the wrong way. One of the sunken ones threw a hook and caught her in the stomach with a sickening crunch. I threw my gun at them. The magazine was empty, and I could do nothing but watch my wife be reeled in like a fish. I felt despair, horror, and anger. It bubbled inside, and my skin felt boiling hot. I dropped to my knees and screamed, STOP! Blood poured down my face. I didn't know from what. I felt sharp, deep cuts erupt from all over my body. Their spears? I glanced down. No, they weren't spear wounds. Blood poured from deep lacerations in my skin and hovered in the air before me. I saw my own blood, suspended in the air, stretch out into thin, 
needle-like tendrils. I had no idea what was happening. The thin tendrils of blood shot out in a conal wave in front of me. Like tiny little spikes, they pierced through everything. The deck, the railing, and the hull of the ship. Nothing seemed to stop these spikes of blood erupting from my body. They pierced the sunken ones in a thousand places, leaving their bodies in tatters. And they pierced through Lydia. Black blood sloshed on the deck, flowed down, and mingled with the ocean water. The fishy, misformed sunken ones all writhed on the deck in death throes. And my Lydia, my beloved wife, took her last breath, soaked in her own blood. The hook in her stomach hadn't killed her. I had, somehow. The blood, my blood, I didn't understand it at all. It had spilled from me. It had formed into actual objects and stabbed through the sunken ones. But how? The wounds on my body began to close. I saw the red-ridged spiral scar on my forearm. A reminder of the virus I had survived nearly five years ago. And it burned like I was branded with hot metal. It burned so hot I couldn't stand it. The pain radiated through my arm, and I screamed, overcome. A hand grabbed me from behind. I turned and saw Captain Abad's face. He dropped his rifle on the deck, and it slid into the water. The bolt was locked. He'd emptied the rifle during the fight. He pulled me up. I don't even want to know what that was, he said. But you saved us, though. He pulled me into a lifeboat. He hit the release and we plopped into the water. He piloted us away from the Ocean Liberty. But then, a scream erupted through the night. Louder than a tornado siren. Louder than a jet engine. It was the loudest sound I've ever heard. I dared not look back, but Captain Abad did. He screamed and his face contorted. He ripped ferociously at his face, clawing out his eyeballs before I could get to him. I knocked him out with the hardest punch I've ever thrown. He slumped to the floor, hard. I lifted the man and secured him in one of the seats. I didn't dare look back, though. I kept my concentration on Abad, and once he was secured, I looked toward the horizon, away from the Ocean Liberty and whatever made that terrible scream. I opened my hands, not realizing I was cupping my face. That one look at whatever made that noise drove Captain Abad to insanity. Chief Petty Officer Jordan Brownell sat across the table from me, transfixed. And that's what happened to him? Brownell asked. You've examined him. He won't talk anymore, I said. Brannell eyed me suspiciously, and coincidentally, he's the only one who could corroborate your story. Why would I be lying? Do you think I murdered an entire cruise ship, sunk it, and then ran here? He shook his head. No, but what you said about your blood turning into spears, was that you or something else? I don't know, I said. What do you think Abad saw? Brownell asked. What made that scream? I really don't know. But that sunken one, that creature, it told us that their father, some hunter of the shadows, was rising from the depths. Maybe that's what Abad saw. That's quite a story, Brownell said. You don't have any more concrete information on the spire? How could I? It's just speculation at this point. But it must be the source of all this. I can feel it. I don't know what it is or where it's from. I paused and shook my head in frustration. 
Don't you know more about it? Haven't you sent people to study it? We have, and we haven't heard back from them. We've looked at images from our geological satellites, but it doesn't look good. The spire, as you know, is like a giant auger. It burrowed itself into the crust of the Atlantic Ocean floor. Our best guess is that it actually pierced our mantle. He took out a can of chew and put some in his lip. The top of the spire still sticks out of the ocean. Only, it's disrupted the crust so much that it's created new islands fresh from molten material. A scream erupted. A wailing, roaring scream echoed from outside the ship. Brannell jumped to his feet. I could hear him now, calling me. The father of the deep, he said I was chosen. His voice was mesmerizing. Murray, hey, what the fuck? Brannell shouted. Blood poured from my eyes and down my face. Cuts opened in the palms of my hands and blood floated around me like tiny red raindrops suspended in the air. I could feel it now. I could make them move. Brownell drew his sidearm. Stop it, Murray. Please stop. I will shoot you. I formed the droplets of the blood into a javelin. Two shots rang out, piercing my chest. The blood didn't spatter, but instead floated in the air around me. The wounds in my chest closed automatically, and I hurled the blood javelin through Brownell's chest, pinning him to the wall. The gun in his hand fell to the floor. He twitched in pain and gasped for air. You'll have to excuse me, sir, but I must be going. I grinned. The father has called.